Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 403. It's Tuesday the 9th of June 2015, and so nice to have you here. Tonight, we've got an exciting show for you. We've got a chance for you to win a free copy of Unraid 6 Pro. Ooh. Oh, and we're going to be talking all about the new Unraid 6, which is up and coming. And we've got a very big announcement with regards to that product. If you haven't heard of it, you're going to hear, hear about it tonight. Stick around. It's very exciting stuff when it comes to data storage, virtualization, gaming, multimedia, all of the above, Sounds and awesome. so much more. So stick around. Okay, over to the newsroom. Sasha, how are you? I am great. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. A South Korean robotics team has won the DARPA Robotics Challenge. Google has unveiled a collection of 40 new special street view images as part of its latest update. And those ones are underwater. YouTube's new analytics tool, Music Insight, reveals some surprising stats about the world's most popular musicians. And the first Steam machines are available to pre-order. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Krista Wells. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. So nice to see you. I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Erica Lalonde. Erica, how you been? I've been great. Good, good. Great. Going back to school. Back. More school. <laughs> back to more. That's crazy. More of the grind. But yeah. it'll be good. And you know what? I'll be experienced. I'll be an experienced college student. So I know what to expect now. You Working know? so hard. Yeah, you marketing and marketing, managing, um, small businessing. How much small businessing, marketing <laughs> and managing? I, I feel like there's a rap song coming on. Awesome! Hey, tonight we've got an exciting show for you. We're going to be talking about Unraid Six. It's an up and coming product, uh, and we are going to jump right into it. And uh, this is an exciting night because we have a big announcement for you. And hey, if you uh, if you are joining us from the Unraid community, welcome to the show. If you haven't heard of Category Five Technology TV before, well, it's it's super great to have you here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that you'll join us on an ongoing basis. We're big fans of Unraid, and uh, it was so nice to jump back into the Unraid forums and into the community there and see some of you. Uh, such a great community that you've got going on over there. And uh, so what is Unraid? Well, we're going to hear from uh, a guy that knows all about it in just a couple minutes' time. But basically, let's just say this. Your computer has so much power these days. I mean, unbelievable amounts of power. You've got gaming computers that you know people buy that have mm -hmm. these incredible CPUs, these processors, and the GPUs are underutilized. But the processors have virtualization technology, and a lot of us are really just more interested in, I just want my computer to be fast, so I got the one that has the high-end processor. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't realize that there are some features that are included on that chip that we're probably not utilizing to their full extent. So tonight's product, what we're going to be looking at, is going to actually help us to really utilize the processing power of our storage NAS devices. Maybe we can create a, a little bit of a server, uh, just to give you an idea, that we could game on and it has massive amounts of storage and redundancy and that is able to play our multimedia files to many different devices simultaneously. So it's a very exciting, limitless possibility product and it's called Unraid 6. I'm going to jump over to a spot just so that you can see what it's all about and then we're going to come back and talk to John Pinazzo uh, from Lime Technology right after this.
Want to have ultimate control over your data and applications? With Unraid, you can partition system resources, enabling you to store and protect data and run any applications you want. We do this by combining the capabilities of a NAS, an application server, and a virtualization host, all on the same system. Using almost any old PC, you can create a system capable of massive data storage. Data disks in your array can utilize 100% of their capacity and are protected by a single parity disk. Should a disk fail, simply replace it and Unraid will rebuild the lost data automatically. To increase performance without sacrificing protection, HDDs or SSDs can be used to create a cache pool. As you fill your system with data, just add more storage to increase capacity without complexity. With more memory and a better processor, you can serve applications using Docker, which makes it easy to share files, back up other devices, stream media, and much more. With virtualization-capable hardware, you can leverage KVM so you can watch content, play games, and do work using any OS you want, all on the same hardware. Unraid makes it easy to turn any system into a multi-purpose computing powerhouse. You decide what you want to build and determine your own level of investment. Unraid will scale its capabilities in parallel. All right, this is Category 5 Technology TV, and tonight I am joined by John Panazzo. John, it's so nice to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, hi, Robbie. How you doing? Doing good, man. You? Excellent. Excellent as always. Great. We're going to get right into it with John in just a couple of moments' time. He's going to be telling us all about this exciting product. Of course, we're familiar with Unraid here on Category 5 TV. We featured it back in the uh, early 100 episodes. Uh, 103 was a big episode when it came to Unraid. You want to check that out if you haven't already done so. But back then, Unraid was really all about what? Storage, I suppose, eh? So we're talking about creating a storage array and being able to utilize storage space, lots and lots of different hard drives uh, on the cheap. Well, now Unraid has come a long way, John. And uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about what Unraid 6 means to us. So if you could explain just a little bit about what is coming and uh, what is on its way from Lime Technology. Yeah, absolutely. Well. The main purpose of Unraid 6 really stems back to looking at our community and the hardware that these guys were buying to build their NAS. You know, you mentioned this earlier, a traditional network attached storage solution doesn't really use a lot of that processor. They, it, it doesn't need that compute resource. It needs I.O. It needs input output. And uh, what we found is that a lot of our community members were going out and buying these really big systems to put all of their data on. And it's like, well, what are you doing with all that extra processor usage? And you are doing nothing is reality. Uh, so what we really wanted to do is find a way that lets everybody take, to the fullest extent, advantage of their hardware. Uh, leave no stone unturned, take advantage of every ounce of power that this thing has to offer. And it really starts by understanding how we can safely separate the ways that we store and protect data from how we serve applications and from how we create and access content. Um, in the traditional world, you're probably familiar with this. A lot of times you'll see people have three different systems potentially in their home, a box that's dedicated to serving applications, a box that's dedicated to storage, and a box that's dedicated to do their work on, something that they're going to go and download, browse the web, and whatnot. Right. And the reason we always had this separation goes back to an old school IT way of thinking, which is separation of duties, and that's to keep every application in its own world. But because of virtualization technology, we're able to contain each one of those aspects of computing inside of a single physical box so that that same user can now take those three different physical appliances and potentially consolidate them down to one. So, John, now when I think about a NAS or network attached storage, I'm thinking about something that just holds my data. So it's somewhere that has maybe Samba sharing CIFS. I'm able to drop my stuff on it. And to give you a scenario uh, along the vein of what, what you're talking about, at my house, for example, I've got a storage NAS and we've got a computer separated 
to then stream Plex, and then from Plex it goes to any of our devices. So we've got a, a Roku on the TV, we've got an Amazon Fire TV stick, and we've got our computers and our mobile devices. So mm -hmm. how does Unraid 6 now kind of streamline that whole uh, paradigm of how we're able to stream something like Plex? Sure. So Plex is a pretty easy one. It's been around for a while, uh, and there's been a lot of NAS solutions that have incorporated its use. And so with Unraid, the idea is you can add Plex as an application directly into the platform, take advantage of all of its capabilities, and utilize your CPU to transcode media in real time. So if you've got a mobile device that doesn't have a good enough wireless connection to your local Wi-Fi router and it can't support the quality of the video that you're trying to watch. Plex will do that for you in real time. It'll transcode it, yes. uh, lower the bit rate, and let it get to that device with ease. With Unraid, the idea was to make it really easy for folks to get Plex on their system, be able to take advantage of it, along with a whole host of other applications. So in your scenario, as you described, I think you said you had a separate box that was responsible for Plex That's than right, the yeah. box that you had for your storage. It's like and a so Debian Unraid, machine, a Linux machine with Plex mm -hmm. server installed. Yep. So with Unraid, you just literally would put Plex right on the same box that's storing in your data. And this does a number of things both right in front of you as well as behind the scenes. So right in front of you, it consolidates the hardware, right? So instead of having two boxes, now you have one. But behind you, what you're not seeing behind the scenes is how much less work you're putting on your computing infrastructure to deliver that experience. So in your scenario, all that data has got to leave the NAS go to the computer that's going to do the transcoding, and then send all of that out to your Roku or whatever other device you have on the network. Right. With our solution, everything stays in that one box, so all that heavy lifting of getting the images and getting the video content to the box that's going to do the transcoding, well, it's already on the same box, so it doesn't have to go over the network for that. Brilliant. Okay, I, I want to know a whole lot more about this now. Unraid 6 is a huge step for Lime Technologies, uh, Lime Technology, sorry, and with this new release, we're talking about being able to not just have storage, and, and just to backtrack a little bit, what has Unraid always meant to me? It's been redundant storage. So if I have, say, seven hard drives that I want to put into a, a computer, and Unraid lets me use the entire capacity of all of those hard drives, and unlike a traditional array and a, a traditional RAID, uh, those drives don't have to match at all. I think my array has a 340 gig drive, a couple 500 gigs, a one terabyte drive, and a couple three terabyte drives. And they're just all mix matched. And I think I've even got one of them is an IDE drive. And then I've got separate SATA controllers. It's, it's crazy because it comes against all that we've ever learned with the old style way of thinking in IT that everything, you know, every drive had to be exactly the same firmware, the same, uh, same size capacity, and Unraid has totally flipped that on its head while still giving us single drive parity uh, failure tolerance. So we've got the redundancy, we've got uh, a new level of being able to um, install something like Plex. So can you, let's expand on that because you're the pro when it comes to this stuff. This is all new to me. Now you've been developing this for how long? Uh, a little over a year and a half now. So we started at the end of December of 2013 uh, is when we began our mission on Unraid 6. Um, and it's been a little over a year and a half in development now. And uh, yeah, we're very proud of, of what we've been able to put together. I think that when people look at what Unraid 6 is capable of and compare it to Unraid 5, I mean, we've had people on our forums even say, is this a NAS anymore? Is, this, <laughs> is that the category? Does it fit to that category? And I still think it does. I mean, that's really what Unraid was born from. But we've just found a safe way to add a whole bunch of additional capability to that platform. Um, letting the NAS be the base for it all. Brilliant. Do you have a way that you can actually show us what we? Yeah, can absolutely. From so, 6? yeah, I'd love to give you a quick demonstration here. Um, so, let me go ahead and turn on screen sharing here. Okay, great. And while John is doing that, I'm just going to let you know we are giving away a free copy of Unraid Six Pro, uh, oh. and John's going to tell us a little bit what is different about the basic and the uh, the Pro version. Um, and so all you have to do now, originally we had thought, you know, you've got to watch this live, but then there were some people in the Unraid forums that had mentioned, but I can't watch at that time because it's whatever time it is at, at home, uh, because of the time zone difference mm -hmm. all around the world, we've decided to extend this over the course of the next week. So if you're watching this, uh, between now and the, let's see, what is next week? Next week is the 16th. So if you're watching this before June 16th, 2015, all you have to do is email, uh, and that is contest at category5.tv. Pop us an email with your, uh, we just need your email address really uh, out the gate. We're going to be hosting a draw on the, uh, on the episode next week on the 16th. So back to John. John, if you could show us how this works, I'd love to see it. 
Yeah, absolutely. So just first off, what we're looking at here is actually our Unraid dashboard. So this is a new page that we added in Unraid 6. Okay, so I'm, uh, still, seeing, you... I'm still seeing you, just so you're aware. Uh, oh, you are. Uh, yeah, let's see what's going on with screen sharing here. Okay. This is live TV. There we go. Five TV. Yeah. He's got it all figured. Right. There it is. Enough? You know nice. what? For all it's worth, with all the technology that could go wrong, that was pretty impressive. It took about five seconds to fix, John, so well done. Well, you know, it's it's one of those <laughs> things where I double-clicked instead of single-clicking, so it was easy to fix. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh. So, all right, so here we go. So what we're looking at right now is actually the Unraid dashboard. So this is, again, it's a new page we added to the web GUI for Unraid. Um, okay. and it gives you kind of a summary view of your system. And one of the new things that everybody notices right off the bat at the top here is this new apps panel. And this gives you a uh, bird's eye view of everything that's running on your system in real time. Uh, so what I wanted to show to kick things off was what it's like using applications on a NAS that's a little bit different on Unraid than maybe what you're used to. So we'll start with maybe one that people are familiar with, and that's Plex. So I might be, maybe I went a little too quick there. I should slow down. So when you click an app icon, uh, you get a number of options, and, and to actually launch the app, you'll click the web UI icon. And this actually brings me into Plex. So this is a familiar world to you. You're probably used to seeing this. I can go and I can play any movie that I want to play. Uh, if I want to watch the Bourne Ultimatum, I hit play. And just so you know, the box that I'm doing this all on right now and I'm streaming from is the same box that I'm talking to you from. It's the same box that I'm working within right now. Really? Uh, because I'm able to do this all on the same system at the same time. Uh, so this is just a basic example of a traditional app that most people are used to. But, you know, when I think about how we do applications on Unraid 6, showing Plex is great. But if you look at Plex, it's pretty much the same on every NAS platform. So let's talk about an app that maybe you're not used to seeing. And that's an app that has a full, what we call, desktop GUI. So when people think about apps to put on a NAS, we're thinking about web-based applications, things that are designed to be served through a browser. But what about an app? that needs a front-end client piece of software. So uh, from the Linux perspective of things, there are apps out there that just aren't available as a web-based version yet. And CrashPlan is one of them. Another is the Vert Manager for uh, virtual machines that runs on Ubuntu. Yep. Uh, these are not available as traditional web-based applications. So well, how do we get into those guys? Well, what we can actually do is we can log in and get equivalent of, oops, went too quick there. Uh, get the equivalent of a full desktop session, but through a browser. So what you're seeing now, this is not a web-based application. This is a full wow. GUI client that you would expect to see on a Windows, a Mac, or a Linux desktop PC. And through this client, I'm able to go ahead and configure on my Unraid system which folders and which user shares I want to back up. Really? If I want to add a backup, wow. I simply click it, I hit save. And again, this is all a web-based experience, but not coming from a web-based world. So are you so looking at you're looking at a Linux desktop obviously in this situation. So could could we run any Linux program in there just like virtualization would? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, this is essentially the equivalent of a virtual desktop. Um, you know, the one difference is that it's using the processor to render all the graphics. So there are some things that might not have as solid of an experience as they would on a full desktop where okay. everything is local, nothing is remote. But for any type of app um, that requires basic administration, something like CrashPlan, and even some higher-end apps like we have video editing and um, uh, picture editing software, they are usable over a remote connection. Um, but it's a great way to be able to add just a huge library of applications that were previously unaccessible to somebody who wanted to load them on an NAS. Sure. John, how hard is it for you to switch back to your camera when you're chatting with us? Because we're looking at a, a still screen there. I, I'd love to be able to see you when we're chatting. Um, yeah, sorry about that. No, that's cool. Um, that is awesome. So is that a VNC connection? Like, what are we actually looking at when you're bringing that up? Well, we'll do another one here to give you an example. And okay. this is an RDP connection, just like the last one was. Uh, so this is a, um, an application that's for photo editing. It's something that a photographer would probably use. Yeah. And we've, we've covered it all, the table here. Yep. It automatically pops up as soon as I launch the connection. So again, it's all delivered through a browser interface, but this is, just like the previous one, an RDP connection. So we're leveraging okay. the remote desktop protocol uh, because it delivers, frankly, a better user experience than VNC when you have this kind of content that you need to display. Right. Now, I don't see a, a GUI for uh, an operating system. How are we... Well, in this instance, the goal of this particular, what we call container, is yeah. just this one particular app. Just that. So this itself. is the only app you need to launch in here. And that's kind of the idea of Docker, which, which I should probably explain. So I'm going to cut back to video here for a sec sure. uh, to explain Docker. Yeah. So the, the, the way that I'm doing this, the way that I'm launching each of these apps, 
and doing this safely is by making sure that they each live in their own personal bubble. So if I make it so that they live in their own personal bubble, they can't touch each other and they can't cause problems with each other. And that's what happens a lot of times with application support is you get in this scenario where one app messes with another's dependencies and now the whole thing comes crashing down on you. So we isolate every app into its own bubble so that they can't affect one another. And that's how Docker works. Um, so I'm able to run Plex in its own world. Guacamole is an RDP gateway that lets me connect to other virtual instances. Okay. Uh, Darktable, like we said, is a photo editing software. Yep. Uh, Crash Plan is for my backups. But each of these lives in their own world. And what's great is if one of these needs, let's say, Ubuntu, and another needs Fedora, and another needs Red Hat, it does not matter which operating system the app was written for. It will run just the same. And this happens because as we download these applications, every bit that is required to run them is automatically downloaded from something called the Docker registry. So if you're trying to run CrashPlan for the first time, it's going to say, okay, this container is based on Ubuntu. Do you have Ubuntu? No, you don't. Really? Let me pull that for you automatically. That sounds uh, spectacular. Uh, John, we still don't have your video, um, so we're just kind of looking at my bald mug today. Uh, but if you're able to get that back up. Oh, here it comes. Um, perfect. Thank you. Um, so... Is this like a traditional um, virtualization style platform? Docker sounds it, a lot different. I mean, being able to launch uh, applications it is very specifically. Different. Yeah, it's very different. Um, so the best way to understand Docker is for, for people who understand virtual machines, the way I explain it to them is that it's virtual machines without emulation and way smarter resource management. So the biggest thing that VMs would add to a system is a little bit of overhead, right? Because you have to emulate hardware. But Docker right. is Linux aware. So that means that Docker, and this you can be seen as a limitation, it only works with Linux applications. So because it only works with Linux applications, the guys at Docker were able to take advantage of everything Linux has to offer, pull out all the stops, and leverage things like snapshotting. So again, let's say I have three apps here. One of them needs Ubuntu, and another needs Ubuntu, and another needs Ubuntu. I only pull the Ubuntu image into my storage once. It realizes that it's already there, and for the other apps, it makes a snapshot of that image uh. so that if they need to make modifications to settings or anything like that, yeah. each container still remains its own identity, its own settings, its own original data, but I'm not replicating all that storage over and over and over again that I would with a VM. Wow. It's almost like a volume shadow copy of sorts, it sounds like. It's, it, that's another way to think of it. I mean, people have tried to come up with good analogies for Docker, but it yep. solves so many different problems in such a unique way. It's hard to come up with an analogy that fits it correctly. But I try to think of it as like the ultimate app to get, the ultimate online app store combined with a free way to publish applications up there. So anyone can contribute to Docker. So our community members who had been providing previously plugins for a long time, uh, they had expressed some challenges to us relating, relate, ugh, relating to application support. And what we wanted to do is just make things easier for them, give them access to tools that Unray doesn't have access to, and containers do that for us. It lets them pick whatever platform they want to develop for, use whatever tools that platform has to offer, and push something out to the world that anyone with Unraid can consume. Awesome. We're speaking with John uh, Panazzo from Lime Technology. Uh, they are the developers of Unraid and, of course, Unraid 6. We've got a big announcement for you coming up. If you have a question for myself or John, give us a call on the Cat 5. It's uh, the Cat phone. It's 2545. <laughs> Cat 5 TV. And of course, you can also uh, message us in the chat room. Erica is uh, making an effort to uh, keep track of uh, the Lots questions of, that are coming yeah, in. Yeah, everyone's loving uh, the interview with John right now. Of course. Of That's course. great. Very informative. <laughs> and we actually have a quick question. So is, uh, is any uh, Unraid 6 support for MB um, as a media browser? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, there is actually an MB container uh, available that you can add to Unraid thanks to our community. So uh, there's actually a little over 150 applications so far that our community has made specifically designed for Unraid to make it really easy to launch. But you actually have access to over 14,000 pre-built images that are available from wow. Docker. So the way we explain this to folks is wow. there's two ways to add an app. The easy way and the little bit harder way. The easy way is right through our web interface where our container authors have gone through the process of configuring templates so folks can just click and get going. But technically, if you're a developer and you want to mess around with stuff that we haven't even published yet, you have access to anything that's available on Docker. Really? Wow. Okay. Now, John, with Unraid itself being a web interface, uh, I see that you're sitting at the Unraid system. You're basically operating it with multiple monitors, multiple video cards. Mm -hmm. 
because it's web based, can I do the things that you're showing us? Can I do those from uh, other locations? Can I bring that up on different devices or different computers? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the web GUI for Unraid is just a browser based web client. Uh, so any device that has a browser should be able to connect to it and interact with it. You know, obviously the experience of a WAN connection and over the internet connection might be a little different than on a LAN. So some things on a, on a LAN will be better than on a WAN. But in terms of being able to access, I'll give you a great example. The video that you showed at the beginning, well, there were many a late nights doing editing on that video where I would actually go home from the office here and connect into the office over a VPN and then use Microsoft RDP to get into my workstation that's running as a VM on Unraid and <laughs> do the editing, do a big chunk of the editing from home on my MacBook connected to a Windows 8 instance. So can it be done remotely? Absolutely. Am I going to stream a game that is generating 3D content in real time over a 5 megabit upload? Maybe not. Maybe not. Right. Okay, makes sense. Now let's talk about gaming. What kind of gaming can we do with Unraid 6? What does this bring to the gamer? Well, there's a lot of things that it brings. So the biggest thing, again, we talked at the beginning about getting the most out of your hardware investment. So again, we saw these folks that were going out there, they were buying sometimes Xeon class processors, you know, these really high-end Intel processors that have all these capabilities with virtualization and folks just don't understand how to take advantage of them properly. Well, again, the virtual machine that I'm working on right now, we're talking on, and I'm looking at it through a monitor. I'm not going through a remote graphics connection at all, and that's because I can assign a video card, a discrete GPU, from my system to a VM and then provide driver support for that device directly from the VM. So in my system, I'm running an NVIDIA GTX 780 graphics card and I'm outputting those graphics from a Windows VM to my displays, even though the operating system, if you look at it this way, that the hardware is really running on is Unraid. So <laughs> what this does is it lets me get all of the full power of that GPU dedicated to a single virtual instance. And I could launch a game right now and start playing and I wouldn't notice a difference between that and physical. Can we do that? Can we we can try. We can try. I'm not sure how the video stream is going to come across uh, so our Skype connection, but it's. Uh, oh yes, okay. That's going to affect. Uh, yeah, we don't want to knock to out. To give the you Skype an idea, connection. though, this is my game library. Um, I'll, I'll pull it up for you to show okay. real quick. And what, uh, it, what it's sounding like to me is that Unraid. You mentioned about people asking, "Well, is it still just a NAS? Is it classified as a NAS?" It's really sounding a lot like a hypervisor to me, but with direct hardware connections for the virtual machines. Am I well, right? hypervisor is a feature to us. So we're not, okay. we're not trying to be a hypervisor as much as we're trying to utilize a hypervisor as a feature. So the hypervisor we okay. use is called KVM. Um, some people might know, uh, remember it as Q QMU. And yep. essentially, it is a feature of the Linux kernel that lets us create VMs. So this is different than some folks might remember about traditional virtualization where the hypervisor is the OS. You install the hypervisor. With KVM, that's not the case. It's just a feature. It's just a component okay. of what our, our kernel can do. Nice. Okay. So show us more. Yeah. So, uh, you know, from the gaming perspective, there's a couple big things that I like to talk about. So first is, is gaming storage management. So one of the biggest things that frustrates me as a gamer personally is when I would go to install a game, I want to put the game on my really fast SSDs. Why? Well, I want it to load quick. I want to be the first in every multiplayer match. I want to be the first off the line. And that's what most gamers will do is they want to load the new games on the fast storage and put the old games on the old storage. But unfortunately, Windows doesn't make it really easy for us, neither does Steam, to just migrate these games from one location to another. You actually have to uninstall them, then reinstall them, telling Windows, hey, I want you to go to the D drive instead of the C drive. Yeah. But one of the things that we're working on in an upcoming release is going to be able to move these games from one storage device to another, but not making Windows aware. So for example, my entire really? games library here, yeah. you're familiar with our user share concept, all of them go through our user shares. So the idea is, if I want to move a game from living on an SSD to an HDD, Windows still sees it as C colon slash blah, blah, blah. It still sees the same path. But on right. the back end, on the storage management side, we can actually move where those blocks sit from being on really fast SSDs huh. to slow HDDs and never have to go through that reinstall process again. So are you using SSDs as part of your Unraid array then? Absolutely. So we actually use a combination, and this goes into a feature update that also comes with Unraid 6, which is our ability to pool cache devices. So in the old Unraid, right. you know, the, the, the old saying was very simple. You could get a large amount of storage on an Unraid system by having one parity device and a large number of dedicated data disks. Like you said, it could be any type, speed, size, brand, protocol. It doesn't make a difference. Yeah. Well, we also had a feature called the cache, and the cache's job was to simply accelerate write operations to the array, and that was it. And the cache was great, but it had one major flaw, and that was it didn't offer data protection. So when you were writing sure. to the cache, 
If that device failed, yeah, you would lose that data. Uh, yeah. But now we actually have a cache pool. So you can take the same philosophy that we approached with building the Unraid array and use that to build a cache pool of devices of different sizes, of different types, and can dynamically scale it on demand. Okay. So that so, cache pool serves both virtual machines as well as my fast game content, and then I can dynamically move it from fast to slow as I choose. Nice. Okay. So just back, just to, to um, kind of clarify, and we're still looking at just your game library there, so that's why the camera's Sorry. on me. But um, to clarify what that means, basically, when we're storing mass amounts of data on an Unraid array or any kind of NAS array, um, the cache works as a kind of an interim step so that it mm -hmm. saves to something faster. So you've got that SSD so that as I'm saving, it's going to do a really, really fast write. So then I can offload that data onto uh, cheaper, um, larger, slower disks. Uh, right. You'll see this in hybrid drives even. Hybrid drives use this mm -hmm. kind of technique so that they've got a, a small SSD but then they've got a large, say, a terabyte or four terabyte or eight terabyte drive. But because of that SSD chip that is in the interim, it uh, it really seems to be operating very, very quickly. So you've added redundancy to the cache drive itself, which is a fantastic thing. That's honestly what's held me back from using a cache drive specifically. Because when we're offloading large amounts of video data, the last thing that we want to have is uh, our cache drive um, cack out on us and then lose, right. the, lose the data during transit. Um, so is that how is that redundant? Is that a, a RAID level one or? Yeah, we use a technology called ButterFS. It's a different type of file system, and we use a RAID one format for their pooling capability. But it's not like a traditional RAID one. A traditional RAID one, you really only have two devices, and they're essentially a mirror, and that's it. Yeah. And if you want to expand, you're actually going to a different RAID type. Uh, with a ButterFS RAID one, the idea is very simple. For every block that I need to write. I write it to two different storage devices. That's as simple as I can put it. So if I have three disks, I can actually create a RAID 1 ButterFS pool out of three devices, and it will figure out how much total oh. capacity based on the ability to split blocks between those disks. So it's not using a parity disk. It's using some other form of... Uh, so you're actually getting a larger pool than if you just had a RAID 1, for example. Is that how I, Am I following correctly? You're basically getting half of your total storage capacity because you're yeah. mirroring. You are mirroring, but you're able to do it across more than just two devices, and you can dynamically size it. That's another okay. big advantage to this is that you don't have to define a RAID group where I create you know, a, a number of devices, pair them up. They usually have to be the same size, speak, brand, bro mo uh, protocol. That does not happen with Unraid 6. You can mix and match your devices in the pool just like you can in the array. It doesn't make a difference. Very cool. All right. This is Category 5 Technology TV. We're speaking with John Panazzo uh, about Unraid 6. We've got a big announcement about Unraid 6 coming up in just a couple minutes' time. And we've got a copy of Unraid 6 Pro to give away. Email contest at category5.tv and just uh, say hi. That's all you need to do because all we need is your email to draw you from a hat. And next week on the 16th of June, we're going to be making that draw for you and contacting you by email. But you'll want to tune in. John, I love the product. I'm excited about the direction that you're taking. Um, what else can you tell us? I mean, I, I'm thinking about all the things I'd love to ask you. Like when you're talking about ButterFS, I'm thinking, okay, are we, you know, is our main data pool still ReserFS? Are we branching out into other file systems? These are things that I want to know. I'm not sure if they're of interest to the, the masses particularly. Um, if you have questions, um, make sure you give us a call, 2545-CAP5TV or message Erica in the chat room. Uh, we have great feedback on this Unra Un Unraid 6. We have uh, a comment from uh, Re Re Fox? Reluctant Flux. Re Reluctant Flux. My apologies. Um, so he's saying that Unraid 6 finally offers what I've been waiting for for over a decade. A decade, uh, John. A decade. You You're thought it him, him and me people. both. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> both. No, and I mean that's that's the industry that I came from. Was was a world based around virtualization where you could do more with less. And I came to Unraid and saw Unraid as a possibility to bring that value to the consumer market. Yeah. That's why Tom Mortensen and myself and Tom Harms and Eric Schultz, the entire team here at Lime Tech, has been really busting our butt to bring this out to everybody because we know your box can do a lot more than you even realize. Right, and, and I love the idea of being able to deprecate uh, seemingly good hardware on my on my uh, network as well, and put everything in one place. It's going to save high, uh, electricity. It's going to save you know heating up my house with computers. Well, I'll, I'll go a step that. further with you, Robbie. I mean, yeah. you, you, let's say you have two devices, right? Well, 
there's a number of facets you should think about about those two devices. So number one, it's not just about, hey, this device is good enough to stream media to my TV and this device is good enough to store and protect my data. That's two physical investments. That's two motherboards, that's two power supplies, two processors, two sets of memory. It, you have a whole investment in a system, Whoa. right? Well, if you can collapse that together, here's the big benefit. I, as a gamer, right, I would be really upset if I did this and then all of a sudden my gameplay experience went down as a result. But if I don't have to buy a NAS on top of my gaming PC, well, maybe I do put a Xeon processor in there and maybe I take that extra budget and I apply it to getting a, a 980 graphics card instead of the 780 I got. Well, if I take those extra dollars and I put them into that, compared to what I would have built individually, run the benchmarks next to each other, and that one system, even with less resources, will deliver a better result. Here's a great way to think about it. The system I'm on it has an Intel i7-4790K processor. It's an eight-core processor. And I did a bare metal physical test against a virtual machine. And I wanted to see what with 3D Mark, which is a pretty popular benchmarking tool for gaming, what would I score? Well, here's what I did. When it ran bare metal, I gave it all the resources. So it had 16 gigs of RAM. It had all eight cores of the processor to work with. And it had that GTX 780 to work with. When I ran it as a VM, though, I kind of cut it off at the knees. So I only gave it 8 gigs of RAM instead of 16, and I only let it control up to 75% of my CPU. So I, I isolated the cores. And when I ran the benchmark, the result was only a 3% decline. So 3% overhead, and I get a gaming VM on a box that I can also stream my media from, so my, my wife and daughter can be downstairs watching Finding Nemo while I'm upstairs playing games, and no one's the wiser. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I, I sensed where you were going with that, John. Mm -hmm. And the thought of being able to reduce our how many things we need to purchase in order to centralize. Uh, back to Reluctant Flux. You know, he's, he's basically saying it's a gaming machine off a of vid card, a media center, and plus it adds the application um, isolation and NAS capabilities. That's exactly what we were just touching on. Eh? Like, it's fantastic. It's great. It's an all around. Thank you, Reluctant. <laughs> <laughs> okay well we've got uh we've got a copy to give away make sure you email us uh contest at category 5.tv john i, I want to see more there's so much that you can show us uh but really i mean what it comes down to unraid has been in uh, unraid 6 has been in the works for quite some time uh there was even uh a time when you know things were pretty hush around lime tech as far as uh what uh what was coming out because you guys were working so hard on developing the the new ui for the web interface and everything else that has gone into this uh, love to hear more about what is big and upcoming from Unraid. Uh, and also, we've got a big announcement, which I'll, I'll throw over to you, uh, something that we've all been waiting for, uh, people who have been, uh, you know, a long-time Unraid users. Uh, but for those of you at home, this will affect you as well. John, I'm going to just throw it right over to you. All right. Well, the big announcement is that we are releasing Unraid 6 on June 15th. So we are six days away from our, uh, sorry, 6.0 final uh, hitting the streets. So if you want to download today, you can. It's currently in release candidate, but the final version should be out on the 15th. So you'll be able to get that from our website at lime-technology.com. You can also go over to cat5.tv slash unraid. Just a real quick way, easy way to uh, remember it, cat5.tv slash unraid. And uh, make sure, now you mentioned being able to download it. Uh, is there, a, I noticed in the promo, there's a free trial. What are the three different tiers for Unraid and how do those work for us? Absolutely. So there is a free trial. It's a 30-day trial. And after the 30 days, uh, if you need a little bit more time to evaluate, you can request an extension. It's built right into our web interface to do that. Uh, but the three tiers of Unraid 6 are Basic, Plus, and Pro. And so Basic will support up to six attached storage devices in your system. Okay. Plus will support up to 12. And Pro will support up to 25. So with 25 disks, so we're talking... Uh, 192 terabytes of potential storage capacity if you use eight terabyte drives. Somebody fills up a system with that much data, I, I want to see a picture. <laughs> <laughs> That is incredible. Okay. Yeah, that's where things are at now. And I guess as drives get bigger and bigger, then that number goes up and up as well. So it's, it's pretty spectacular. 
Yeah. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Uh, John was just saying this coming Monday, we're going to see the full release of Unraid 6. Go get your free trial now, cat5.tv slash Unraid. And of course, you can check out the, uh, the other versions there, up to 25 discs. Now, I have to ask, because it came up in the, uh, in the forums, John, is there a long-term goal here? Uh, mm. Because, you know, people are speculating, you know, what is the announcement tonight? And, and for those who follow along in the forums, I understand that you know that this is coming because you've had the release candidate for some time. And, and so, you know, maybe it's, uh, you know, well, what is it that we're going to announce? What else is on the back burner? What, what is coming after this? I mean, you guys talk behind the scenes and, uh, and, and I can see the smirk. There's something, <laughs> there's something coming. Can you, can you share that with me? So I'll give you, I'll give you a little hint, a couple hints. So, you know, our primary focus is on three markets, like I think I mentioned at the beginning, which is technology, media, and gaming enthusiasts. And the first release of Unraid 6 is really geared towards the techies. So guys that look at what we're doing and say, wow, that's really cool. I can get a lot more out of my investment. I can build my own VM. That's the first target. But we want to take this a lot further. Our end goal here is to make this more accessible to a wider audience. And that starts by making things a lot easier. So as great as I think we've done things with Docker and with VMs and making it relatively easy to create things in our web interface, you know, I know there's a good chunk of folks out there that are still scratching their head wondering what a virtual machine is. So it would be much True better enough. if we could make it so that folks could just download a VM, run the VM with the right hardware, and not have to go through that installation process, the configuration process. So those are the types of things that we want to work on in the future is is delivering that that full experience out of the box as opposed to an IKEA experience where you've got to build it a little bit yourself. So Unraid as a platform versus Unraid as, as kind of a DIY project. It's smart too, mm -hmm. I think, uh, from a business perspective and from a planning perspective to release to the techie, the tech savvy people first uh, because we're, we're the ones who are going to get into the forums, I'm sure, and, and start sharing what our experiences are and maybe even help with some of the, the testing and, and things that go into that. Um, is there any plan, I know it was on the roadmap some time ago, is there any plan to introduce uh, any level of dual disk fault tolerance? I had a feeling you might bring this up. Um, so, you know, when it comes to dual parity, um, there is something that we'd like to do with dual parity, but it's just not the right time for us to put that on the roadmap, mainly because we don't know what the impact's going to be. Uh, so we need to do a little bit more R&D and a little bit more testing work to make sure that it's not going to negatively impact any of the other capabilities of the platform, especially sure. when it comes to performance. Uh, but that is something that we would definitely like to do, uh, but there's considerations for it. So I can't confirm or deny that we're going to add that at any point, but I can say that it is something that obviously a large percentage of our users have expressed interest in, and it's something we're going to pay close attention to. Very good. I think these days, too, because drives are so large, we can get away with running um, less drives in our array because the more drives you have, right. the more chance, uh, you know, just ratio wise, the more chance of a, a drive failure that you have. So I keep my array at about seven drives and that, you know, with four terabyte drives, that gives me more than enough space to work with. So John, is there anything else that you'd like to cover here tonight before we uh, let you go and move along with the show? I think the one thing that I'll, I'll leave you with is we talked a lot about gaming and we talked a lot about tech and we showed you some apps, but one of the things we didn't really talk a ton about was media. And so we showed Plex, but I want to talk about the flip side of Plex where, where Plex was kind of born from, and that's XBMC, uh, now known as Cody. So I want folks to think about this for a minute. So we showed VMs. We showed the fact that you can do this locally, that you can actually run a VM and get graphics output to your monitor directly. Well, what about in your living room? So what about consolidating the capabilities of a NAS with a box that can actually play media content directly? And I want you to think about that, especially in relation to 4K content. So the biggest complaint mm -hmm. that I hear from our users, and not just in our forum, but in any forum, uh, when it comes to media playback is buffering. And the number one cause of buffering is a network. Well, what happens when you get rid of the network? Because the same device that you want to use to play your content is the device that stores your content. Well, what you get is you get a seamless playback experience. So the same idea of running Windows to get games and all sorts of content delivered to your monitor so you can use Unraid as also a high-performance workstation, that same benefit will live in the living room to deliver a high-performance, high-quality, buffering-less uh, media playback experience for all of our users. That's an interesting point. Now, I, I, and I think, though, too, with having Docker apps, you, having the ability to transcode also um, is, you know, supplements the, those who need to have a network because I don't want a great big box sitting in my living room. Actually, right. I do. I do. But my, <laughs> wife, my wife would kill me. 
Yeah, same here. <laughs> you should have seen the early demos where I had my big giant super cooler tower living in the living room for a while as we were doing testing. So yeah, yeah I, I can appreciate the female perspective as well. Just as we wrap up on episode number 103, and now here we are at episode 403. 400. So, you know, Holy. that many, 300 Beautiful episodes search. later, here we are. And John, I'm still running the same Unraid server that I built on episode number 103. That's how reliable it, it has been. We've changed out the motherboard because we burned out capacitors on the motherboard. Nothing to do with Unraid right. at all. And I was very impressed that I was able to take out the broken motherboard, replace it with one that wasn't even a match completely different motherboard and Unraid picked everything up and booted and I was back up and running within a couple minutes. Uh, we've replaced hard drives, we've expanded our array, we've added larger parity disks so that we could expand to larger drives because at one point the largest drive that I had was 750 gigs. Now we're up at four, four terabyte drives. Four so this whole process from episodes in the past 300 weeks. <laughs> yeah, but in 300 weeks, we have constantly grown. And I'm excited to see that now this is a platform that is not just for the data storage, but also for our virtualization, for Docker apps, and for our actual uh, being able to use applications across any platform. It's basically platform agnostic at this point, isn't it? Yeah, and that's kind of the idea. That's why we wanted to add Docker and virtualization because the same benefits of being able to uplift your storage devices, move them to new hardware, that applies with apps and VMs as well. Um, so we just wanted to make it easy for folks to be able to grow their investment over time, make more economical decisions about how they do parts replacement, how they do upgrades, and not be forced into this world of, oh, you want to grow a drive? Okay, we'll buy a whole new set to find yeah. a whole new RAID group and manage that. And by the way, you can't use any of your old disks with it. That, that, mon that model just does not work anymore. And I appreciate that. Mm. So this is the economic <laughs> model from that perspective as well, being able just to throw more, uh, more storage at it and not have to remove any of the other ones. John, that's all the time that we have. I so appreciate it. We could just sit here for, everyone says, a two-hour show. There it is. <laughs> yeah. Let's jump right into it. I got it. too many Barely questions. <laughs> it's just so great. Uh, if you have questions that we have not been able to get to, and Erica, I appreciate you keeping up with the, with the chat room there. If your question didn't get answered, please email us live at category5.tv. I promise you I will pass it along to John. Uh, also, get into their forums. You can find that um, Very helpful. just by going over to that website, cat5.tv slash unraid and you'll see the link for the forums there the community is wonderful and very active so we'd encourage you to do that as well uh, john thank you so much for being here tonight thanks for having me robbie this is category 5 technology tv thanks for joining us and hope you're having a fun night and uh, that is a fantastic product i'm so excited and and happy to have had uh, you john on the show so thanks for the call all right we are like, I can't oh. believe how <laughs> much fun and time we can spend chatting about <laughs> Unraid. I mean, it's exciting stuff, I, and I can't wait to. I almost try feel it. bad that the news has to interrupt the show. <laughs> that was a great interview. I I want. I, can I be in the contest? Yeah, can, can I, I be in the contest? Eligible? Everybody, just yeah, send, send your send your uh, ballots. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, over to the newsroom. Here is Sasha Dermatis. It's Tuesday, June 9th, 2015, and here are the stories we're covering this week. For the first time, the DARPA Robotics Challenge was performed with untethered robots, and a South Korean team took home the $2 million prize. Google Street View technology is now taking us diving in some of the Earth's most remote and breathtaking underwater habitats. YouTube is helping musicians plot their tour locations by telling them where their fan base is located. And steam machines are on the horizon, and we're not talking about ironing. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Thanks, Sasha. And we have been talking about it tonight, but if you're watching the Category5.tv newsroom, make sure you email us, contest at Category5.tv. We've got a free copy of Unraid 6 Pro to give away, and that's going to be happening next week on the 16th. We're going to be doing that draw, and uh, all you have to do is email contest at Category5.tv to qualify. If you'd like more information about Unraid, go to cat5.tv slash Unraid. Back to the newsroom, here is Sasha. I'm Sasha Dermatis, and here are the top stories from the Category 5.TV newsroom. A South Korean robotics team has won the DARPA Robotics Challenge. The contest is a battle of robots on an obstacle course meant to simulate conditions similar to the 2011 Fukushima nuclear plant disaster. 
Team Keist's DRC Hubo humanoid robot defeated 22 others to win the top $2 million prize from the U.S. Department of Defense's DARPA Research Unit. The robots had an hour to complete a series of tasks, such as driving a car and walking up steps. Not bad. To be fair, I have trouble doing those things. <laughs> well, <laughs> the challenge was the first where robots performed semi-autonomously without being tethered. And there were plenty of falls soliciting groans and laughter from spectators of the contest, which was held in California. Other tasks the robots had to do included getting out of a car, presumably the one they were driving, opening a door, drilling a hole in a wall, turning a valve, and crossing rubble either by clearing a path or walking over it. Team Keist was the fastest, completing all the tasks in 44 minutes and 28 seconds. You know, the thing that I think is best about this is they were talking about the Fukushima disaster. Um, There is still ongoing destruction there those robots could conceivably be shipped over there to help with some of the cleanup of water that's still leaking into the Pacific because then humans aren't at risk in the cleanup. Yeah, and I wonder if uh, during the course of these disasters, I mean, I hope beyond hopes that that kind of thing never happens again, but even uh, simple things like a uh, simple, but uh, say a natural disaster, Mm -hmm. for example, being able to go into places that would be extremely dangerous for humans um, you know, firefighters and all these kinds of things that, you know, could be um, supplemented, I would say, by autonomous right. robots. That, that would be amazing. Things mm-hmm. like, I mean, if there is a bomb threat, then it's sending in one of these robots yes. that, that could manipulate yeah. a situation and maybe mm-hmm. diffuse a bomb or something. It's a yeah. great, Certainly I love expendable. this. Yeah, perfectly great use of technology, <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> Google has unveiled a collection of 40 new special Street View images as part of its latest update. As well as the regular images, the new views let you swim with humpback whales in the Cook Islands, dive off the coast of Bali, and take a beach stroll in Samoa. Google's Street View team created the new pictures alongside the Catlin Sea View Survey, the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, and the Chagos Conversation Trust. The project is part of the Google Earth Outreach, which began creating underwater views in 2012, along with Catlin, in order to help monitor the conditions of some of the Earth's most remote and breathtaking habitats. But they also give us, us bystanders, an bystanders, an amazing view of unseen worlds. On Google's blog, the company says, mapping the ocean is the key to preserving it. Each image in Google Maps is a GPS-located digital record of these underwater and coastal environments, which can be used as a baseline to monitor change over time. So perfect and fun. And I think it's funny that they call it a street view when it's underwater because there's no street. <laughs> it's the tech. It's the technology, yeah. yeah. I think what's interesting about it is that thinking along the lines of 100 years from now, and even though the technology would seem quite obsolete and horrible at that point, the fact that they have that kind of record mm-hmm. is, that's what is astounding to me, that they've been able to use the technology just for that aspect. Right. It's Historical good for, record. Yeah, for environmental and um, and scientific reasons, but then we benefit from it because it's also beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So... Now, YouTube's new analytics tool, Music Insight, reveals some surprising stats about the world's most popular musicians. YouTube tells musicians, this data can help you get a song added to a radio by showing a programmer how big your local fan base is. It also reveals that, for example, Ed Sheeran is really big in the Philippines. His videos have been streamed in the country more than 178 million times since September 2014, making it his third biggest market after the U.S. and the U.K. I bet you he'll do a concert there now. On the country music front, Blake Shelton and Miranda Lambert have been named Male and Female Vocalist of the Year five times running, but their fan base is almost entirely restricted to the USA. This new data lets artists see where their videos are being streamed, helping them plot tours and target their most fervent fans. I wonder who's most popular in Canada. (laughs) No no Bieber jokes, please. (laughs) No, 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 no. Uh, Yeah, I wonder. I think that's really cool because um, 
I think YouTube has been a bit of a black box as far as, okay, well, in, I can see how many people see the videos. I can see you know, generally where they're from, but that they're opening it up to musicians to be able to see specifics about, you know, what markets are really saturated by their music. That's a whole, that's putting a whole new spin on the analytic data that Google is providing, that YouTube is providing. Uh, as a musician myself, I think that's pretty great. Mm-hmm. I think it'll probably save travel time for Mer- who is it? Lambert and Shelton? Mer- Blake Shelton? Yeah. And Miranda Lambert? They don't have to travel Seriously? outside the U.S. That I out. know that and you don't? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know music. Well, Blake hosts, uh, he's one of the hosts on The Voice. So that's probably one of the reasons he's got so many people in the States, I think. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The first Steam. I'm changing the subject. Yes. I know nothing Moving along music. to gaming platforms. <laughs> exactly. The first Steam machines and attempts to bring PC gaming to a wider audience are available to pre order. PC makers Alienware and CyberPower have both announced machines that will be sent out to buyers in October. Several Steam machines will be out this year. An attempt by games publisher Valve to compete with consoles such as the Xbox and PlayStation. The new boxes are going to be pricey, though, between $450 and $500 US. But Hmm. buyers will need to wait until November and pay extra to use Valve's official Steam machine controller. So there you go. I still like my PlayStation, I'll tell you. <laughs> now I have to upgrade for Fallout. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man. Goodness. All right. A big thanks this week to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us. If you found a news story you'd like to send, email it to newsroom at category5.tv. For all your tech news with a slight Linux bias, visit the Category5.tv newsroom at newsroom.category5.tv. For the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Dermatis. Thanks, Sasha. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. My name's Robbie Ferguson. And my name's Erica Lalonde. As well, Category5.tv is a member of the TED Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here at cat5.tv slash tpn and the International Association of the Internet Broadcasters at cat5.tv slash A-I-A-B-A. B I B A I B A. I B I B A. I know. I can't do it. I think I have it. Did you just punch that in? All right, let's try again. I A I B. That's a tough it's the one. Vowels. It is tough. E- International I- Association I- of Internet it. Broadcasters. I had it, man. I had it. And oh. They're all watching tonight, and they're like, "Oh, that's it. No awards for no these guys." No more. I have to interrupt <laughs> for a quick apology because I promised last week that we would get to a viewer question this week. That I now realize that we do not have time to actually cover it in, in the Espaganda. depth. Exactly in the depth it will need because we only have like. Three minutes, and your question will need more than three minutes. And your question is so important to us, and your questions are important to us. We appreciate you sending them in. Email us live at category5.tv if you've got some for us, uh, and uh, we will definitely uh, make sure that we do get to that for you. You understand, mm. I'm sure. But uh, Aspagandu, uh, we appreciate you, and thanks for watching. Thank you, everyone at home. And, uh, yeah. and as well... Quick before we go, Sasha brought in her stamp. Oh, yes. Can we oh. see this, Sasha? Yeah, this over. is exciting. Okay. Sasha's okay. on her way over here. I'm on my way over. Can okay. you see me? Here, let's, let's. Oh, I guess Adam, okay. you can Check make this it. out. Okay. So here's my stamp. It got shipped in, and this is what it looks like. It looks like I wrote it. Yeah. Okay. Back to She's you. She's the tech me. savvy. Look at that. Waitress. Waitress. That looks oh, so good. It looks like, I know, it looks like I put care into each letter. Like as you, I yeah, wrote you it. took your time. With a black pen. Little I do know. they know the you didn't put face. any care into it whatsoever. I put lots of care. I know. I know. <laughs> I so, do not know someone who has, I would, I would come visit you just for that. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> if you are not sure what we're talking about, head on over to our website, category5.tv. And when you're there, hey, go down just a little ways. And of course, if you're watching this after the fact, you may um, have to jump back but in uh, season eight you'll see episode number 399 creating a custom stamp with handwriting and we in fact created that live on the show 
it's an actual self-inking stamp so that Sasha can stamp the back of receipts uh, because you get busy, I guess, when you're when yeah. you're waitressing a busy night and it yeah. can, I guess it, it would be. Well, yeah, the thing is sometimes tables of like 20 people come in and I do want to put a personal message on each the back of each receipt. So yeah. come in for wings and you'll get a stamp. I can't believe how well that turned out. Thanks for bringing that, Sasha. No problem. <laughs> Thanks for watching tonight. It's Category 5 Technology TV and you'll find us online, www.category5.tv. Don't forget as well to check out Unraid cat5.tv slash Unraid and yeah as you were saying the contest contest, contest at category5.tv that's all you got to do send an email include a Super picture easy. if you want um, oh and the postcards text. oh yeah yes thanks buddy yeah you want to win I stuff I love I love reading new postcards we have uh, we've actually got premium vinyl logo stickers of Category 5 TV, and we're going to include that if you win the uh, Unraid as well. Uh, but we're going to send those to the first five people who send us a postcard at our new address. You can get that from Category5.tv. Go, go to the bottom of the site. You'll see it there on every page. You'll see it on the Contact Us page. However you want to get it, be one of the first five people to send us that, and we will send you a, uh, a very special gift. So that's just a local postcard so that we uh, can see where you're from. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Adam, for being here, and Erica, Sasha. Thank you. Happy to be here. Have Have a great great night, everyone. everybody. It's good to be a part of the show. And have you here. Bye, Sasha. Oh, bye. (laughs) (laughs) We hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.